climate change and deforestation. Two topics that we probably wouldn't relate it to a pandemic. But those are actually two of the main driving factors of a pandemic. So the early predictions was that we would only see a pandemic once every 100 years or once every 300 years. When you think about deforestation, that's where a lot of wildlife live. When we do encroach on their natural living habitats, then they sort of move into a different area, into our homes, and suddenly we are in much, much closer contact with these animals and consequently the viruses that some of these animals carry. So right now, the expected duration between this pandemic and the next pandemic, which is equally as severe, is actually just 60 years. Hi, I'm Dr. Kumita. I'm a virologist at USM. I've been working on viruses for close to 20 years now, and this is my expert opinion. Viruses can be quite temperamental. If they were previously living in a very, very cold environment, and now because of climate change, it's a lot warmer, they may be able to grow a lot faster. And again, it's something that can affect us easily. In the past 100 years, we've actually had four influenza pandemics. So the first influenza pandemic happened in 1918, the Spanish flu. That lasted for about two years. In 1957, we had the Asian flu. In 1968, we had the Hong Kong flu. In the early 2000s, we had swine flu. And then, of course, we've been living with COVID since 2019. So on average, I would say we are seeing a pandemic once every 30 years. 75% of viruses that infect humans are actually zoonotic, so they probably came from animals. When we talk about viruses specifically, if they originated from an animal, they can get passed on to humans through direct contact. So Malaysia actually has a lot of initiatives in place. Even before WHO declared the pandemic in March of 2020, the ministry had actually started preparing even as early as January 2020. So what the ministry did was they actually purchased equipment, test kits, and they distributed it to all states. And they also offered training to make sure that if a pandemic did hit, we were all ready. Whenever there's an outbreak anywhere in the world, usually IMR does start preparing and looking at surveillance, looking at possible test methods, so that if it does hit Malaysia, we can already identify the virus and we can detect it as early as possible. In terms of international preparedness, after the swine flu, WHO started putting together a lot of different pandemic framework which was then distributed to all the countries. WHO has played a huge role in making sure that there is international effort, international cooperation, and we see that as well with COVAX, where we can make sure that vaccines are distributed to low and middle income countries so that there is vaccine equity, so we can put a stop to pandemic. But I do understand that, you know, for people who have not been exposed to this information, it does sometimes feel like you don't really know what to believe, especially if there is contradicting information or if the information changes, you know, from one year to another. The United Kingdom and the World Health Organization have collaborated on a study to assess the implications of COVID-19 misinformation. The study found that in the first three months of 2020 alone, 6,000 people were hospitalized and 800 people may have lost their lives due to COVID-19 misinformation. This to me highlights whatever we choose to spread online, especially if they are false, can have real-world consequences. So here's the three things that we can do to deal with COVID-19 misinformation. The first, and the one that I'm most passionate about, is a review of the legislations that we currently use. So for example, Section 233 of the Communications and Multimedia Act and Section 505B of the Penal Code, which to me are like sledgehammers when dealing with such a sensitive problem. Rather, what we need instead would be scaffolds to ensure that only the most heinous types of false information that causes harm lead to prosecution. Secondly, I think what we need is for the government to be more forthcoming and transparent with their information and communication plans. It's not just that people need information to be able to go about their daily lives better, but without this layer of trust, no communication plan by the government or in fact by anyone at all can be truly effective. 
The third thing that we can do is to inculcate a sense of digital literacy among Malaysians. Efforts thus far have rightfully focused on school children and that's fair enough, but we also need to be cognizant of the fact that a large segment of Malaysians have since left school. This is especially important for the older generation, the elder ones among us, who did not necessarily grow up with digital media and might not be equipped with the skill sets necessary to decipher whether information is accurate or not, whether the source is credible or not. And I think we will be missing a large chunk of Malaysians if we only focus on digital literacy building efforts among school children. So here are three ways that we could probably mitigate the next pandemic. I think the first one would probably to improve our human capital development. We do need people in the healthcare system. We need virologists, we need geneticists, we need bioinformaticians to be able to make sense of all these genomic sequences that we look at. Ultimately, these are the people who would help in controlling the pandemic. The second thing that I think is important is media literacy or being able to guide people to understand which information is more reliable and which may be less so. A mother of five pleaded guilty in the Kuala Lumpur Sessions Court on Monday to a charge of spreading fake news on the COVID-19 vaccine in a video on Facebook four months ago. And the third one which has been probably been made more apparent because of the pandemic is social inequality. We talk about how people need better masks. We talk about how people should probably get tested at least once a week to prevent the virus from being spread. But how many people can actually afford it? So what can we do to improve this? All these three things would be extremely important in helping us prepare for the next pandemic. Three different theories how Omicron happened. Um, the first one was that it jumped from humans to rats to humans. Most mutations happen from the last variant, but Omicron actually traces back to 2020. Um, so it is possible that, you know, there was this sort of animal jump in between.